Some say he was a brutal tyrant who made his way to the top before falling in disgrace. Others describe a man who cared deeply about people, his players, his school, his community, and his country. These disparate descriptions tell the story of a man whose name engenders both ridicule and reverence. They also explain why almost 20 years after his death, Woody Hayes remains an Ohio State legend and one of American sports' most compelling figures. Combustible yet compassionate, divisive but devoted, fiery and controversial, yet eloquent and beloved. Such extremes were the essence of Woody Hayes, who for 28 seasons as head coach of the Ohio State Buckeyes, towered over the college football landscape in a reign that saw both triumph and turmoil. In that time, perhaps no other coach in collegiate sports made a more dramatic and often contentious impact than Woody Hayes. Woody Hayes is certainly one of the top five football coaches that ever coached a game of college football. Woody was the greatest fundamental coach that I had ever been around. When people across this country, even though they may not be solid football fans, think of Ohio State, yet to this day, they often think of Woody Hayes. A demanding disciplinarian, Hayes employed a straight-ahead style that reflected his hard-nosed view of football as warfare. It was traditional smash mouth football, and Ohio State played it as well or better than anyone. Woody threw a pass? I mean, <laughs> that's something to write home about. He said there are only three things that can happen when you throw the football, and two of them are bad. We used an archaic defense. We used an archaic offense, and he didn't want to change, and yet we still beat people. Critics scoff, but Woody's brand of no-frills football produced over 200 wins, three national championships, 13 Big Ten titles, scores of All-Americans, and some of college football's most legendary players. He made an average player good, a good player great, a great player superstar, and a superstar out of this world. Hayes' success and larger-than-life personality made him a living legend in Ohio and gave rise to a stature that stretched far beyond the Buckeye State. He was very close friends with a lot of presidents, particularly the Republican presidents. President Nixon wanted to talk about football. What he wanted to talk about history, they talked about history. A tireless advocate for academic excellence, Hayes demanded as much from his players in the classroom as he did on the field. I don't think you would ever find a head football coach that admired academics any more than Woody Hayes. Woody used the football field for us as a classroom. The lectures, the history lessons, the stuff that had absolutely nothing to do with football. Uh, we heard about Rommel. We heard about the German tank units in World War II. That's why you need good teachers and good coaches to push you a little bit. He often would go to Harvard University and lecture on the history of Ralph Waldo Emerson. He was the first one that I ever heard talk about Sung Tzu's Art of War. He would study leaders. Patton you know, was one of his number one guys. But like General Patton, Woody's emotions often erupted into overbearing outbursts and angry assaults. A lot of people loved him. A lot of people hated him. Woody's reputation was exactly what he was. Very volatile, very aggressive, somebody that just is a hothead. He could be extremely boisterous and was known for maybe shoving players at some times, yelling, screaming. He was the boss, <laughs> and the boss did pretty much what he wanted to do. His explosive temper led to numerous altercations and the sudden collapse of his coaching career. In front of all those people, the cameras, you could tell he had lost it. It was almost like the assassination of a president, because at that point, in my heart, I knew it was over. But from his most bitter disgrace, Hayes emerged as an esteemed elder statesman, an Ohio State ambassador, and the seminal figure in the lives he touched. I think he became more of a popular figure than he even was when he was coaching. Woody was loyal to the university even after they fired him. He was so giving, and he practiced what he preached. He was more than a football coach. He was an educator. Um, he was a politician. He was a mentor. He was a friend. He was a true patriot. He believed in his country. And so he wanted to develop young men totally. Woody was a very aggressive, gregarious guy. They didn't know that the guy is the biggest softy that ever lived. He didn't want people to know that underneath that rough, gruff exterior, there was a heart as big as Ohio Stadium. Woody Hayes was always a great person first, and a great a human being, a great American, and he was a great coach. He was the very best individual 
very best person that I've ever been involved with. He built what Ohio State football means. He's the one who put it way up there and made it a privilege to be recruited as a Buckeye and to wear the scarlet and gray. Nobody ever be like Woody Hayes. I've seen the both sides of him, but I saw the heart. I love Woody Hayes. Wayne Woodrow Hayes was born on February 14, 1913, in tiny Clifton, Ohio. Hayes' father, Wayne Benton Hayes, was a self-educated teacher who emphasized the values of scholarship, hard work, and toughness, values his youngest son took readily to heart. Woody Hayes grew up mostly in Newcomerstown, Ohio, where he was captain of his high school football team. And Woody always loved academics. And I think part of that came from the fact that his father, Wayne Hayes, was superintendent of schools in Newcomerstown. I would think Woody Hayes learned some of his leadership skills from his father, but also his toughness. He grew up with a father who let him and his brother Ike box. You know, anytime they didn't get along or they had a fight, they got boxing gloves and they went at it and released all their pressure to each other and everybody in the neighborhood would come and watch these two guys fight. After graduation from high school, Woody went to Denison University where he was an excellent student. He majored in English and history. He was a tackle on the football team and played outfield for the Denison University baseball team and graduated in 1935. After college, Hayes took a teaching job in the village of Mengo Junction, where he doubled as an assistant coach for the high school football team. He planned to become a lawyer, but when his admission to Ohio State's law school was postponed, Hayes accepted another assistant's job in nearby New Philadelphia. Just one season later, he was named head coach. Law school would have to wait. In his first two seasons, Hayes went 18-1-1, but his third team won only once, and many of the players complained about their coach's hard-driving methods. Uncertain about his future, Woody enlisted in the Navy five months before Pearl Harbor and the outbreak of World War II. And then Hayes entered the service. He became the lieutenant commander in the Navy. And I think he would say that his value to this country was far greater being a lieutenant commander and commanding two ships in the Pacific during World War II than it probably was as a football coach. While stationed at sea, Woody received a letter from his college alma mater, who made the former high school coach an unexpected offer. Denison University decided that they would offer him the head coaching position at Denison following the end of World War II. Of course, Denison, like many universities in this country, had given up football during World War II because of a shortage of male students on campus. And so when World War II was over, then he took over as head coach of the Denison University football program in the fall of 1946. With a two and six record, Woody's first season was hardly a success, and his boot camp tactics caused a near mutiny within the team. But his next two teams went undefeated, and an offer to coach Miami University in Oxford, Ohio, soon followed. At Miami, Hayes replaced the popular Sid Gilman, and his arrival came as a shock to the team's returning players. He was a bear. Woody came in with a system that was entirely different that we had to learn. And the first year was a disaster. But just as he had at Denison, Woody bounced back with an outstanding sophomore season. The next year, we had a great football team. We beat Cincinnati, who was going to the Sun Bowl at the time, 28 to nothing. The same day that Michigan played Ohio State in the Snow Bowl. The Buckeyes' Snow Bowl defeat led to the firing of coach Wes Fessler. Suddenly, Woody was a candidate for one of college football's biggest jobs. But to most fans, Woody Hayes was an unknown entity, and public sentiment quickly focused on a previous Buckeye legend. There was a lot of interest among a lot of the Ohio State fans and some of the very, very prominent supporters to bring Paul Brown back to Ohio State. In fact, it was a big campaign with buttons and bumper stickers, BBB, Bring Back Brown. There was a push 
for certain things. And, and in the football team, it was for Paul Brown because of his reputation as a great football coach from Maslin, Ohio, and coming to Ohio State in the early 40s and, and bringing a national title to the team and, and having all of the background of pro football. And he was very much interested in the job. But in spite of Brown's very public support, the Ohio State administration passed and offered the job to Missouri's Don Ferro. Don Ferro came into Columbus, accepted the Ohio State position, and Dick Kilarkins, the athletic director, had to think that, well, this is really good because we have a very prominent college coach now that will take over the head coaching job from Wes Fessler. He accepted the job, went home, and talked to his wife, and his wife was a little apprehensive about Columbus and the, and the high pressure uh, things that were going on. Well, three days later, Larkins got a call from Ferro that he had changed his mind and had decided to stay at Missouri after all. So Larkins got his athletic uh, selection committee back together, and that selection committee made two decisions. The first decision was not to enter, interview any more candidates, but to make their second choice from among the other candidates who they had not selected. The second decision they made was to offer the job to Woody Hayes. For many, the selection was seen as a letdown, and expectations for the 38-year-old Hayes were decidedly downcast, just the latest coach buried in Columbus's sideline cemetery. When Woody Hayes took the head coaching job at Ohio State in 1951, Ohio State had, in my opinion, very rightfully earned the dubious distinction of being the graveyard of coaches. Hayes was the sixth different head coach within a span of just 12 seasons. Coach Hayes took over an awful job at Ohio State in 1951 and came very close in those early years, as, as everybody is aware, to losing that job. People wanted him out of town as quick as they wanted him in town. A mediocre three-year record of 16-9-1 had Hayes looking like Ohio State's next coaching casualty. But the 1954 season would change everything for Woody, for the Buckeyes, and for the history of college football. Hired in 1951, Woody Hayes entered the 1954 season faced with mounting pressure from Buckeye fans and local would-be power brokers. In Woody's first three years at Ohio State, the Buckeyes were 16-9-1, and 1. and 1954 was kind of a make-or-break year for him. A lot of the Ohio State fans were thinking another mediocre season and Hayes will be gone and we'll replace him with another coach. The people downtown had put some pressure on and, and Ernie Godfrey, who was one of the coaches, came to him and said, uh, uh, the downtown people want you to step down. And uh, his famous words are, the hell with the people downtown. I'm not stepping down for anybody. With his heels dug in, Hayes delivered one of Ohio State's greatest seasons ever. Led by halfback Howard Hopalong Cassidy, the Buckeyes, picked fifth in the Big Ten, shocked the conference and the country, posting a 10-0 record en route to the school's second national championship. The stunning season was a critical turning point in Woody's fledgling career, a fact he readily acknowledged. Years later, Woody Hayes often said that Hopalong Cassidy in that 1954 team probably saved his job at Ohio State because had the Buckeyes been about a 50-50 team in 1954, chances are he might have been replaced uh, going into the 1955 season. Hayes kept his job and his program began to roll. In 1955, the Buckeyes won another Big Ten title, and Hopalong Cassidy was awarded the Heisman Trophy. The Buckeyes' success brought Hayes a newfound fame, as well as unwanted scrutiny. A 1955 magazine article in which Woody admitted loaning money to players resulted in an embarrassing one-year probation and a growing wariness of the media. I think what it came to is there was like three or four players he gave five bucks or something to, and somebody told on him because he did that. So they asked him, he just told him, yeah, he didn't lie about it, he didn't try to cover it up. He says, yeah, I loaned loan him some money he needed, he needed this dumb, boom, boom, and he's going to pay me back. I don't think they found anything big, but it was his heart, you know, if somebody needed something, that's the way always what he was. Hayes was not aware that loaning money to players was against an NCAA uh, rule, and 
when he had so openly shared that with the reporter, and when the reporter put that in his column, I think he felt like he'd been violated a little bit. But Woody rebounded the very next season when the 1957 Buckeyes won another national title. Hayes was named National Coach of the Year, and the stain of probation quickly gave way to a renewed sense of honor and prestige. To the delight of fans, the Buckeyes were now seen as a perennial football power. But that was an image some on campus could do without. In 1961, the issue came to a head when the school's faculty council denied the team's Rose Bowl invitation. The episode sparked a campus-wide protest and brought to light a growing rift between Woody and some Ohio State administrators. Well, there are always some people in the campus that are resentful of football. They don't like the game. They don't understand the game. And at that time, probably there was some of that toward football in the program and toward Woody. There was a tremendous jealousy against Woody because in those days, if you said Ohio State in the same breath, you said Woody Hayes. And they wanted to de-emphasize Woody. Woody was quite a powerful person. Even the governor came to see him and would wait to see him. So uh, it was not unusual that a lot of the faculty there thought he was too big for his riches. Faculty members who opposed the trip cited growing concerns over the increasing influence of corporate commercialism in amateur athletics. But the crux of the controversy centered on perceived tensions between athletics and academics, subjects Woody felt went hand in hand. It's people like that who didn't understand that Woody was a regular attender at the faculty club. He came from a family of uh, where education was very important. And Woody was not gonna let you get away with less than your best ability. And that included the classroom. There was nobody who was more strict with his players than Woody Hayes as far as getting grades were concerned. Many years after some players had finished their football careers, Hayes would still be on them to come back to Ohio State and finish up and get their degrees. And he would call too. If guys left, he would call them and say, when are you coming back to graduate? You can't get out of here. You only got eight more hours. He'd stay on you. And he would force players to be attorneys. Every time I would see him, he didn't care um, you know, how you doing, what's going on. He would always ask me, have you enrolled in law school yet? Over and over and over again. And finally I told him, I said, coach, I don't think I want to be a lawyer. And he says, I don't care. You need to go to law school. He considered himself a professor, a teacher first, and, um, and preached that, harped that with his kids. So I think from that standpoint that the academic people were a little bit off base really in trying to make such a strong separation. Hayes accepted the faculty council's decision, but bitter feelings remained, and as the 60s unfolded, the emotional episode left lingering effects. The biggest thing was it was much, much more difficult now for Woody Hayes and his staff to go into Ohio and recruit the real outstanding Ohio high school football players to come to Ohio State. It did hurt recruiting because there were coaches around the Big Ten who would say you don't want to go to Ohio State because uh, you never know if they win the Big Ten whether they're going to be able to go to the Rose Bowl or not because of the feeling between the faculty and the athletic department. Several subpar recruiting classes took their toll and the 1966 Buckeyes limped to a four and five record. A two and three start the following season had many fans calling for Woody's job. We always assumed that Woody was above anything, that Woody was beyond being touched. You know? uh, but we, you couldn't ignore the signs. I mean, there were, were floating signs around the stadium. Uh, Woody's gone. Uh, I think one of the sports announcers calls for his, called for his uh, firing. But that's what Columbus is like. And they demanded the best. And they weren't happy that we were getting beat by some of the teams that we were getting beat by. If you don't win at Ohio State, you're going to have plenty of heat, and you're going to have airplanes flying around the stadium, and you're going to have all kinds of stuff like that. With his critics circling in, Woody appeared headed for early retirement. But just as he had done in 1954, Hayes bounced back from the brink with a season for the ages. 1968 would see the Buckeyes back on top, leaving a triumphant Woody Hayes standing poised to enter the golden age of his brilliant career. As much as anyone, Woody Hayes understood the fickle nature of coaching in Columbus. When asked why he never accepted gifts,
Hayes quipped, they give you a Cadillac one year, and the next, they give you the gas to get out of town. Woody responded to that truth the only way he knew how, by working hard and winning games. Join us next week for part two of our special look at Woody Hayes. Until then, for Buckeye Classics, I'm Archie Griffin. Thanks for watching. In spite of winning two national titles, Woody Hayes entered the 1968 season under fire from both fans and media alike. With his career in the balance, Woody responded with a season that would usher in a decade of unprecedented Buckeye dominance. But from his most glorious heights, Hayes would suffer a crushing fall from grace, only to be reborn in the twilight of his days. Join us now for part two of our special look at an American football legend, Woody Hayes. At the start of the 1968 season, even the most ardent Ohio State fan could not have predicted the historic campaign that was about to unfold. Less than one year before, the Buckeyes looked like a program on the brink of collapse, their legendary coach a relic of days gone by. In 1967, they were hanging Woody and Effigy at the corner of 15th and High. I'm not so sure I really recognized the pressure that Woody was under, but I knew that he had to win more football games or they were going to get rid of him. Woody's trouble stemmed from the school's decision to decline the Buckeyes' 1961 Rose Bowl bid. The ensuing fallout fell mostly on recruiting, forcing Hayes to adjust his 1967 enlistment strategy. That was the first year that Woody went out of state. And he got some pretty good football players. You could go across the line through the backfield offense and defense, and there were all Ohioans, uh, high school All-Americans, at almost every position. The class became known as the Super Sophomores, and their inaugural campaign would end in perfection, a 10-0 record and the consensus national championship. The season saved Woody's job and opened the door to a new era in Ohio State football. I really believe that the 1968 season was kind of the beginning of maybe the new modern era in all of Ohio State football, the first Big Ten title in seven years. Woody Hayes really had his greatest success at Ohio State from that point forward. This 10-year stretch saw Woody's Buckeyes claim a piece of nine Big Ten titles while playing in six Rose Bowls. It was also the time of the 10-year war, a high-stakes showdown against the team Hayes derisively referred to as the School Up North. Woody would always say just bad things about Michigan and you know, wouldn't, wouldn't even say the name Michigan. I've heard the stories of him having to go into the state of Michigan with someone. Uh, they're driving back towards Ohio and their gas tank is uh, nearly empty and he doesn't want to buy gas in the state of Michigan because he doesn't want to support their tax system. I remember one year at Michigan uh, practice during the week, Woody had police on the top of Lincoln Memorial Towers during that week because he had told us that Bo was watching our plays and he truly believed it. Everything that week was just at a different level. You know, the intensity, the practices, the, the tension from the players to the coaches, everyone involved and that came from Coach Hayes. After the game was over, one of the press people asked Woody Hayes, you know, Coach, you're ahead 48 to 14. Why did you go for two? And he says, by God, because we couldn't go for three. He had an obsession with Michigan. You know, you got to beat Michigan. He'd tell me, you start to work on Michigan right now. You work on Michigan today. You work on Michigan next week. Woody's maize and blue fixation was grounded in a simple reality. To coach in Columbus, you have to beat the team from Ann Arbor. He knew that the Michigan game was the game. If you lost that football game, that was a losing season. Even if you were nine and one, that was a losing season. When Hayes came to Ohio State in 1951, Ohio State had won only 12 of the previous 47 games against Michigan. Hayes was 16, 11, and one against the Wolverines. And during the 24 year period from 1952 through 1975, Michigan won only seven of those 24 games. The legendary rivalry reached its zenith when Michigan, looking to regain the upper hand, hired one of Woody's dearest disciples. Woody and Bo were great friends. Now, that's like you asking your best friend, and he's going to go up and coach against you. Now, you know you can't let him beat you. <laughs> In Bo's first year at Michigan, 1969, Michigan pulled off one of the greatest upsets of all time, defeating Woody Hayes' 1969 team 24 to 12, 
Ohio State at that time was riding a 22-game winning streak, longest in all of Ohio State football, and that set the stage for the next nine years. In coaching, I was probably Woody's closest friend. And, uh, but during the 10-year war that we competed, we never talked. I never called him on the phone, he never called me. When Woody had his heart attack, he woke up in University Hospital, and Woody always said, I thought I was looking at an angel. And he said, I saw Bo Schembechler. There was Bo sitting at the end of his bed. They loved one another. They had great respect for one another. But on the football field, you threw all that aside. By the mid-1970s, the Ohio State Buckeyes were seen as the quintessential college football powerhouse. That success and the platform it provided imbued Woody Hayes with an influence far beyond his gridiron glories. He was really becoming a national figure. He was very close friends with a lot of presidents, particularly the Republican presidents, uh, Richard Nixon and, and Gerald Ford of Michigan. His association with Nixon was very strong. Woody wanted to talk about war and <laughs> politics, and Nixon wanted to talk about football all the time. I remember one of the longest practices of the year was when Spiro Agnew resigned. You know, he was a staunch Republican, and Spiro got in all this. Hey, oh, my God, what a long day that was. Eager to engage, Woody took a deep interest in the issues of the day. It was the hippie movement. Drugs were on campus. Uh, free love was on campus. Um, political unrest was on campus. There were protests every day. They had to close the school in Ohio State. And he would go out to the Oval, and he would speak to the kids. He wanted to talk to them and tell them what, what he felt because, you know, he had some deep thoughts and he expressed himself very well to young people. Woody understood it better than most people give him credit because he went to Vietnam every year. And he went around and he saw a lot of our soldiers and he didn't put it on an expense account. He, he put it on his own nickel and he called those parents and said, I saw your son and he's fighting for our country. He was a principled man. Don't be the bus driver that wants to go faster than 55 miles an hour. Because he'd be up there sitting next to you saying, why are you driving so fast? Don't you know the Arabs have an embargo against us? Don't you know you're wasting gasoline? You're hurting America. He was a fierce patriot. And he instilled that sense of value. I mean, it's, it's great to honor country. He would walk to work because he thought that he was hurting the country by buying oil. He wouldn't take a raise because it led to inflation. Probably Hayes may have thought he was fighting a little bit of an uphill battle. He was very conservative at times, and that was certainly was in conflict with a lot of the more liberal views that were being uh, shown out and demonstrated on the campuses. No one was conservative at that point in time. Um, everybody was wearing all kind of colorful outfits and plaids and bell bottoms and stacked heels and all kind of things. Woody rolled with a punch and was able to live with it. He didn't like it, everything that he saw, but he was able to live with it. What Hayes couldn't handle was defeat, and his tireless work habits became the key to his success. He always told us, I am not the best coach, but I will not get outworked. Some nights I'll wake up and hear that projector going and get up and walk, his doors always open, never close his door to his hotel room, and he sat there fall asleep watching film. He wasn't the smartest coach, he'd be the first one to admit that. He wasn't one that was gonna create all these different formations and plays and everything. He won football games. That's why he works so darn hard at it. He figured that uh, he, he always took the assumption that all the football coaches he was going against were better football coaches. Woody's greatest asset was his ability to be a, a discipline on the field and off the field. He disciplined his players, and they respected uh, his discipline. When Woody walked in, people got quiet. They sat up straight, and, uh, you know, he commanded that respect and, and got that respect. There was only one way to do anything, and that was Woody's way. And Woody's way wasn't uh, wasn't fancy. That's Ohio State football. We're, we're not one for outsmarting people. I mean, that's not what Ohio State's all about. Nothing fancy, not caviar, just good, solid meat and potatoes football. That's what I learned from him, and that's what Ohio State should always be. And there was a lot of criticism then of, of Woody for that three yards in a cloud of dust. But he was winning ball games, and he was winning them within the rules, and that's the bottom line. But for those closest to him, Woody's wins often came at a cost. Uh, Woody wasn't the easiest man in the world to get along with, 
And I think it's very, very difficult for the wife of any coach who is dedicated to his profession. I think one of Woody's biggest disappointments was not being home and helping Ann raise their son, Steve. Steve felt that he probably didn't have a father uh, for a lot of those years because Woody was so committed to, hit, to the kids of the football team. Annie, I don't think was a casualty. She loved the fact that he was in his domain and he was happy. But it was different because he really was married to high state football. I remember being at a luncheon where she spoke here in Columbus one day and somebody said to Ann, with all the traveling that Woody does, with all the time he spends looking at films, with all the time he spends with players, recruiting, with his trips to Vietnam, have you ever thought about divorce? And Ann thought about it for a moment and got a little grin on her face and she said, divorce? No, never, never. Murder, but never divorce. By 1978, Woody Hayes had become a living legend, an in-state icon with national notoriety. But as the sun began to set on the twilight of his career, Woody's grasp of control was beginning to slip. In the last couple of years, I felt like he was starting to lose some control over the, or over the athlete. He suddenly realized and didn't want to face it that he didn't relate to the kids like he thought he was doing. You could see Woody slipping. I could see it very easily when I was out of coaching, watching the film, coming to the games. He was having difficulty winning the big game, and that was really getting to him. Since their 68 title run, a top-ranked Buckeye team found itself on the wrong end of five late-season battles with national championship implications. But worse than big game losses were a growing string of well-publicized incidents that landed Hayes in continuous hot water. He would punch a photographer, or he'd throw a camera, where he, he would do something that would get played up in the national press. Woody Hayes' temper tantrums uh, probably became a little bit more uh, pronounced during his last years in the 1970s. They seemed to be more frequent. Uh, they seemed to be much more intense tearing up the yard markers up of Michigan in the 1971 game there, and of course, a lot of the run-ins with the, uh, the press during the 1970s. He was so focused and bent on winning that sometimes he overlooked some things that were probably weren't the right protocol for how to act in a situation. We saw the outburst on the field every day in practice. So something that might occur in a game like that, though it was absolutely inappropriate in that kind of a situation, I don't think it surprised us in any way, shape, or form. A million times! Get on out! I know you get out after he beats you. Dumb s***. That's all you are. We used to judge the explosions on the practice field in, in megatons. You know, was that a one or a two or a three? And when it got upwards around three, you knew you better start paying attention. You know, we all used to coach that way. We used to grab them with a face mask, you know, and shake them and hit them upside of the head and get their attention, thing like that. But that's, you know, that was 20, 30, 40 years ago. There was all kind of things that you, you remember that he did to, to make football uh, uh, toughness. I mean, it was a tough element, and, and he was tough. But the 1978 season, which included a third straight loss to Michigan, had been tough on Woody, and the always combustible Hayes was reaching his boiling point. One of the coaches on that team was George Chomp. He said, we knew he was going to blow his top somewhere, but we didn't know whether it was going to be in the locker room, whether it was going to be on the practice field, whether it was going to be during a game, just where it was going to be. On the night of December 29th in Jacksonville, Florida, the answer and the end came swiftly. Trailing Clemson 17-15 late in the fourth quarter, the Buckeyes were mounting a game-winning drive. But when linebacker Charlie Bauman intercepted Arch Schleister's third down pass, Woody lost control. When it occurred, it was one of those things where I cannot believe what I just saw. And I gotta be honest with you, I was speechless. In front of all those people, the cameras, and you could tell he had lost it. You know, a lot of people were laughing, a lot of people were saying, oh my God, how, you know, the guy's nuts, but I got sick to my stomach, and then the phone started ringing off the hook. All the Buckeyes calling, so, oh my God, you see what he did? I mean, we were sick to our stomach because we knew that was the end. Getting on the plane, flying back to Columbus, um, 
when we landed, they had already fired Woody, and he got up in front of the plane and on the speaker system of the plane and announced to us that he would no longer be the coach at Ohio State. And, you know, it just went silent. The guys just sat there kind of stunned. And uh, I don't think anybody got off that plane for 45 minutes to an hour. I know that although he had a tremendous temper, that was not him. He was just at the point where he was just exhausted. He was truly exhausted. And you know, when you don't get your sleep, you don't make right decisions. No one does. He was a diabetic, and uh, he wasn't getting his shots right. And sometimes he'd lose his control or his mind. And didn't know exactly what he was doing. I don't want to give an excuse for Woody, but I do know that that was a lot of pressure in that game and didn't take his shots. And as soon as he came to control what happened, he was the most sorry guy in the world. I think he knew he'd made a mistake. Uh, he came back to Columbus, was escorted back to his home on Cardiff Road with a, the, in a police car. And for several days, the blinds were closed. Uh, the phone was off the hook. Uh, you couldn't get in touch with, uh, with Woody by, by phone or, uh, or in person. Three months later, Woody emerged from his self-imposed exile and began to make amends. Do I carry bitterness toward the organization? No, I carry bitterness toward me because we got that game, we got beaten down there when I thought we were gonna win. And nobody in this world despises to lose like I do. No one in this world. It's been a failing of mine. It's gotten me into trouble more than once. But it's also taken a man with mediocre ability and made a pretty good coach out of him. And yet, the thing that makes me apologize is this. I feel very, very sorry for it because of the wonderful people it's affected. I never once did he ever voice any doubts about Ohio State, any disloyal comments. Uh, he was one of Ohio State's biggest fans. And it would have been very easy for him to dwell on the negative of having been fired in a situation that he might not have agreed with, but I think he understood in his heart that they had to make a decision. More than anything else, Woody Hayes never wanted to do anything that would be harmful to The Ohio State University. He loved his university, he loved what it did for people, and he not only demonstrated that through his many speeches, he demonstrated that through his actions. He would help out families in trouble, families in the hospital. He was always there visiting somebody, and always speaking wherever he could speak. All those speeches, you know, he would get checks and make it right out to the charity. The money to him was nothing. If you really study him, that pay-ahead philosophy was really Coach Hayes. I mean, he did more for people that he didn't know. I mean, that's what his life was. In his final years, Woody received two of his greatest honors, dotting the I in Script, Ohio, and in 1986, when he was named Winter Commencement's keynote speaker. Because so seldom can we pay back, because those whom you owe your parents and those people will be gone. But you do want to pay. Emerson had something to say about that. He said you can pay back only seldom, but he said you can always pay forward and you must pay line for line, deed for deed, and cent for cent. He said beware of too much good accumulating in your palm or it will fast corrupt. That was Emerson's attitude and no one put it better than he did. Just four months later, Hayes passed away, but the memory of him lives on, not in wins and losses, but in the pieces of himself he gave to others. He planted seeds that are still in my heart. Notwithstanding my mother, my father, Coach Hayes was the very best. I had two great men in my life, my dad and Woody Hayes. Sure, he was controversial, but from a humanitarian standpoint, there's never been a kinder, a gentler person on the face of the earth than Woody Hayes. See, that's what they could never take away, that he was a good person. But the people that the Woody knew and the people who know him know just how great a man he was. It's an honor that I'll, I'll never forget to be able to not just play for him, but to be around him, to have him as a friend after we were finished uh, playing. Uh, uh, when, when he passed away, it was like losing a parent. It stays with me. I mean, it's been 30 years since we've been gone. And my exposure to Woody and Ohio State uh, still affects my life every day.
Woody was not the only real good football coach out there and the only one that cared about his football team. He was probably just the best at it. At his funeral, Woody Hayes was eulogized by a friend who also knew a thing or two about public success and failure, former President Richard Nixon. Quoting the poet Sophocles, Nixon said, one must wait until the evening to see how splendid the day has been. We can all be thankful today that in the evening of his life, Woody Hayes could look back and see that the day had indeed been splendid. Any Buckeye would certainly agree. For Buckeye Classics, I'm Archie Griffin. Thanks for watching.